Hello everybody, it's Wyvern here with a quick video to discuss the second half of the Warden and the Paunch DLC. And that is, of course, the High Elf side of things. Now in this video, we are not going to focus too much on stats and sort of raw unit capability and more on what their pl the place of these new units and lords and our regiments of renown may be in the meta, as well as what their uh, place may be in campaign and whether or not they might shake things up a little bit there. Uh, and we are going to be including Imric in this comparison as well. I figured because he's a new new character and essentially a new lord being added uh, in alongside this patch. Might as well throw him in since he's not a changing lord. Like obviously Teclis is getting changes, and there's other cha and there's other changes to other units. But uh, for this video specifically, I just want to cover the new stuff. Um, so without further ado, we are going to dive in and start off with Imric, the Lord of Dragons, who's quite an impressive sight and already has kind of earned a reputation as probably the most fearsome new lord of the bunch that we're getting and uh is it justified uh, maybe he's definitely when we look on his paper stats he's very powerful he's a basically souped up star dragon with a little more melee attack he does have fire resistance baked in uh, he's got encourage of course because he's a lord so that's no surprise uh, a little more charge bonus but nothing too crazy there uh, but it's really his abilities that sell it and do keep in mind Imrig is a good chunk more expensive than an ordinary star dragon star dragon's clocking at about 2400 unless you get chevrons which would be kind of odd on a star dragon <laughs> while imric is starting off um much higher than that and with his kit he's coming in at over 3000 at about 3100 gold which you know that's 700 more gold for items but are those items worth it well quite probably there, there's some very strong itemization here lord dragons is his first uh, ability, and this is a point-and-click debuff, 150 meter range, uh, essentially a souped-up and feebling foe, because it debuffs enemy melee attack by 40, melee defense by 24, lasts 30 seconds, and only has a 90 second cooldown. And this can affect any unit on the you know, on the map, which is pretty great. It's not a hero-specific debuff, like, say, Hunter of Champions, or that they need stab or anything of that nature, which is really, really powerful. If you need to snipe out a key target with Imric, this goes really well with him, uh, or otherwise, if you just need to help other units fight, once again, this can be a big boost. Next up, he does have the Star Lance, and uh, the Star Lance does imbue flammable into a target, as well as granting Imric himself uh, increased damage output. But if he's on Dragon, the stat flammable is stacking with his innate fire damage, so he's essentially boosting his own damage output by a significant margin. And this is definitely going to be, I think, making Imric a pretty disgusting lord and really any unit sniper. He's going to be able to get in, do a boatload of damage, uh, and potentially melt face on key single entities, especially. And otherwise, he can synergize with, for example, Sisters of Averlorn or the Fireborn. There are other synergies in the High Elf roster with fire damage, with phoenixes, that sort of thing. But the, the self-synergy here is pretty insane. And these two, sing and I actually think that these two self-buffs and single-target debuffs are actually going to be really the main selling point on Emmerich, more so than the Elfwa that everyone's been talking about. And that is the last point we're going to talk about here, the Dragonhorn. This is essentially an Elfwa, plus 24 melee attack map-wide. Last 16 seconds... 120 second cooldown, three charges. It's very powerful on paper. In practice, I don't think it's as good as many people think. Uh, and in fact, I think it's not as good as I was kind of thinking it was early on because ultimately it is difficult to get a perfect map wide engagement where all your units are benefiting from this ability. And high elf units tend to have very good stats to begin with. And so getting an extra 24 melee attack, I think, is not as significant. Obviously, causing fear can help you hold a little better or maybe help if you're fighting against like Beastmen Cav or something with your Silver Helms, but I don't think that's a huge selling point. You're really bringing this from melee attack, and I don't think it's as important. I think if I was going to strip an item off Imbric, it would probably be the Dragonhorn uh, rather than the uh, Star Lance or especially the Lord of the Dragons. Uh, now, will Imbric be sort of meta-changing meta or game-breaking? I don't actually think so. I think the changes to Teclas are actually going to be bigger. Imric might be a little overtuned. Uh, I do think the stacking of essentially an Elfwa, the Starlands, and Lord Dragons gives you a lot of goodies on one Lord, uh, but he does cost an arm and a leg, and I do think that Alarial, who's not getting nerfed this patch, surprisingly enough, uh, Teclas, who's getting a buff that he does not deserve this patch, and uh, I think... Archmages are actually going to be probably as powerful, if not more so, than Imric. I, I think he's still going to be a bit, a bit of a niche lore choice, just more competitive than, say, a Lithanar or Tyrion, uh, who are much, much rarer sites on the field, or a Prince or Princess especially. Those, those are not very popular. Now, besides that, we do have the figure head of the incoming DLC, or one of the two figure heads, and that is Eltharion the Grim. And I brought him here on two forms. 
his griffin form as well as his horse form because there are a few little differences that I want to note. Um, Eltharian himself is a decent combatant. He's absolutely, he's certainly no world beater, but uh, he's, he's a solid, solid fighter. He's something, a little bit better than say, uh, something, he's, he's better than like Boris or something, but uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. He does get some, a unique variant of the, and this is actually the one he can get in campaign, which is Grim Discipline, a unique variant of martial prowess. Uh, it grants him plus 20, 12 melee defense and 8 melee attack. It's essentially martial mastery, but it lasts until his HP is over 20, uh, under 25% rather than the usual 50%, so it's souped up martial mastery essentially. Uh, besides that, he has lore of high magic, which is a decent lore. It's very flexible, which is nice for multiplayer, but I think it's kind of crap in campaign, to be quite honest with you guys. Uh, he does have some solid items. The Fang Sword of Altharian, essentially a self buff that grants him more physical resist and AP damage, also gives magic damage, which I don't think is too important most of the time. But um, it's mostly about the survivability here. If you bring out Eltharian on a horse or on foot, which I think is a little bit odd, but hey, you, maybe you did bring him on foot, then this will this really only gives you the extra beefiness. Uh, on the Griffin, it can give you a little more damage output, but uh, nothing too crazy. And I, I, well, I do think this extra survivability here is definitely nifty. I don't think it's going to be sort of a massing selling point. I wouldn't be surprised if you often saw Eltharian not bring the Fang Sword. Uh, even if you're bringing him on a Griffin, though. I do think that if, if you're going to bring the Fang Sword, you should bring it when you're bringing Eltharian on a Griffin. And to be honest, I think if you're going to bring Eltharian, you're probably going to bring him on a Griffin. Since, uh, as a sort of cheap support caster lord, you're better off just bringing a lore of high magic Archmage. Now, besides that, he does have the uh, Mistwalker's Barrage. This is an AoE barrage that charges up in melee every 30 seconds, bombards him, can do some damage to mobs of infantry clumped up around him. In my opinion, this isn't really going to be worth it in multiplayer, but it's going to be pretty strong in campaign, uh, since normally if you're playing on a, with Eltharian on a Griffin, you don't want to be staying in combat too long to charge that up. So you're probably not going to get too many uses. Timing those uses to land at key moments is going to be very difficult, and I think in practice you're just not going to bother. Uh, besides that, he, his final ability is the Helm of Everest, which I think is the coolest item on him, and one of the coolest items in this patch, actually, since it means that it, ma it makes a unit that you target unbreakable and makes it so models cannot die on this unit while it's active. And I think this is huge. Even though the cooldown is 120 seconds, even though the range is only 50 meters, I think this can be insane. Imagine, for example, your opponent tries to Spirit Leech your Fireborn. You can deny the first Spirit Leech with the Helm of Everest. Heal them up with Apotheosis. A little bit later, your opponent casts another Spirit Leech. Yes, they chip off seven models, but then by the time they get their third Spirit Leech, chances are you've got the Helm of Everest ready to go again, and you can block another Spirit Leech. And for what should have been uh, 21 kills, your opponent has only netted seven. And so I think this could have some incredibly potent synergies. It can synergize with a Phoenix if you get some really good um, comboing there. But uh, all in all, this can definitely be invaluable on multi-entity units and can make them hold much better. And uh, synergizes very well with Martial Prowess for Hyle, since it lets you keep the models alive and thus heal back up over 50%. Now, do I think Eltharian's going to be a bit of a meta pick? I really don't. I, I think he's going to be very niche with especially the Helm of Ivress and his decent beefiness and damage output. He's kind of an okay fighter, so sort of like a crappier Carl Franz or something. Uh, but I think he's going to be a very niche pick. I think Imric is probably going to be more popular. I think, of course, all the mage characters otherwise are going to be more popular. I think you're only going to bring Eltharian for very specific reasons. If you have specific synergies you want to pull off with, like, Fireborn or something, um, then you might bring this guy. If you've got specific in intentions to keep certain units alive, then Eltharian is probably your go-to. But otherwise, I don't think he's really going to be that popular. Uh, I don't think he's just at that power, that strong, to be quite honest with you guys. And he doesn't get Blood Roar on his Griffin, uh, unlike Hyle, or unlike the uh, Empire... Griffin variant, which is true to tabletop, only Empire Griffin's got Blood Roar, but uh, is worth mentioning. So he's not going to be going in with some crazy terror bombs. Next up, we do have the Archmage, and this is, of course, the new Lord variant that is coming in. Long awaited. They do come in with n all eight generic Lords of Magic, as well as the high Lord of High Magic. Uh, and these fine ladies are very powerful. Uh, dirt cheap, you offer on a horse you, with a, like three spells or two spells. You can three, I think it's three spells you can get. An Archmage for about 1,200 gold, which lets you do some insanely wide builds. Lore of Metal lets you go with super wide builds because you can compensate for the lack of AP on cheap high health troops. Um, the fact that you get the um, 
Arcane Conduit means you still get decent amounts of points of magic, especially stacked on top of the Book of Hoeth. You get some really good ones of magic recharge rate. And you can still take these ladies on a dragon, on an eagle, on, on a, an Ethelon Chariot, granted a non-AP one. So you do have some mount options there as well to make them a little fightier. One unique item that they only get on their smaller mounts is the Armor of the Stars. This is the same armor that the princes get. Uh, makes them unspottable and gives them stock. Not, in my opinion, a super useful item, but something that can help you escape in a pinch or otherwise uh, help you get some cheeky jumps on your opponent. Perhaps you want to get a surprise net or something. And for that, the Armor of the Search can be useful. Just keep in mind this will not be available on a Moon Dragon, so don't be expecting to get some crazy Moon Dragon snipe action going. Next up, we're going to be moving on to the units. And first and foremost, the budget war dancers, the rangers. And uh, these guys, well, I think they're pretty solid. Stat-wise, um, they're arguably overtuned for their for how cheap they're at. 600 gold, these guys do have 20% physical resist, so they're tankier than one would expect. Okay amount of HP, they've got decent weapon strength and a bonus for infantry of 8. So they can certainly cleave through infantry pretty effectively. Of course, with martial prowess kicking in, they're much more capable. And 40 speed means they can close the gap rather well. They also do have four strider and woodsmen, so much like white lions, they fight better in the woods. That said, they are very flimsy. They are fairly expensive at 600. So f while a solid chaff cleaner, they are still going to, they're not going to give you a super cheap front line that you might want as the high elves. They still force you to go relatively elite. And I think that is going to net some difficulties. Uh, I do think these guys might be a little bit stronger than they should be for just how cheap they are. But um, ultimately, uh, I don't think this unit is actually gonna see all that much usage just because it can't hold as well as spears can. And while cleaning up chaff is nice, you have to often have to deal with swarming cav and monsters and units like that, and rangers just cannot deal with that at all. Uh, so I think it's going to be a bit of a niche support tool. Next up, Silver and Guard, which I think is going to see much more use. Now, this is a fairly expensive spear unit at 800 gold, but they do get expert charge defense as well as magic resist and a hefty bit of armor at 75. So these guys are pretty beefy. I think that mixed into, uh, I think it's good to mix like one or two of these guys into a lot of high elf builds, especially against factions like Norska or uh, Chaos or factions like that, where they can act as an anchor that just holds your line for a really extended period of time. Um, they trade tend to trade rather well into a lot of units. I believe they actually beat Tomb Guard one v one, which is pretty insane. Uh, so they can really, once again, they might be a little bit overtuned for their cost, but they are, they are a very, very potent anchor unit. And I think they will remain so even if they get some slight nerfs, either before the patch drops or within a few weeks after. They're just a very solid anchor unit. Uh, and while you don't want to be running a front line of these guys because they're so expensive, having one or two of them in there just to help you hold a little bit longer, I think is excellent. And it does give the Hiles some new options, I think. And especially against like a Bretonia, these guys could really shake things up with their magic resist. Next up, the Regiment Around Talons of Torcoletta, the Regiment Around Archers with Light Armor. In my opinion, these guys, while they've been getting a lot of attention lately, are a bit of a um, niche, I should say, pick. And I really what I'd, I'd rather say is they're going to be, I think, a bit of a meme pick, to be honest. At 800 gold, they're pretty pricey. Their damage output is the same as normal archers, though it does get self-buffed with their fire damage because they do apply flammable. So yeah, they do like a little bit more damage. But, um, and they do get martial mastery. They do get some fire resist. Like they they do have benefits over archers with light armor. But I think that in most cases, you're not going to bring these guys. They have some synergy with Sisters of, of Avalorn. But I think in a lot of cases, you'd rather bring in an extra unit of Sisters of Avalorn than these guys. And paying 800 gold for what's essentially just an archer is a tall order. Um, I, I think these guys are, while the, we're seeing a, a lot of sort of meme and gimmicky sniping strats with them, and we are seeing uh, all these potential synergies, uh, I think that ultimately, much like, say, the Oil Flask and the Fire Synergy on the Huntsman General, these guys are going to be a bit of a niche or functionally not as useful unit as many people would like to believe. Nonetheless, I do think they're a cool concept, and um, they are pretty dapper looking here with the green and red and white uniforms next up we do have the white lions chariots of christ uh these guys i think are pretty solid i think they're a rather well priced ap chariot they do get nice missile resist uh fairly low on armor so they don't hold up too well in stin combat despite martial prowess being there they do cause fear which is nice uh kind of like a lightweight but harder hit about harder hitting and um and tankier versus missiles uh, uh gorby's chariot 
or maybe like a Razor Gore Chariot. Definitely not a bad unit. Uh, definitely could be a potent AP AP Chariot option, but I do think that in most matchups you're you're not going to bring. You don't want too many Chariots as the High Elves, and I think in most matchups you'd still rather bring a Noble Chariot, even after the bug where the Noble was too good against single entities and large units was patched out. So that is worth keeping in mind, I think, with the Lion Chariots of Krace. Uh, that I think they're still going to get overshone by a Noble, though not as much as, say, the Ithilmar Chariot, which I think is now being pushed into uselessness, <laughs> which it was already there, basically. Next up, the War Lines of Krace. We've got, of course, the Regiment Round, as well as the Vanilla Variant of these guys. Cool units, in my opinion. Uh, do shake things up. Give the High Elves a bit of cheaper mobile AP, which is very nice. Can help you in those cavalry fights. Can give you some decent anti-skirmishing options. Uh, they do have some built-in missile resist, so that's nice. Compensates for their flimsiness a little bit. Uh, they can tear through infantry rather well with their bonus for infantry. They've got solid solid combat stats. Certainly not amazing, but 30 and 28 is no laughing matter. And I just think they're going to be a good augment for cavalry plays. Back up some Silver Helms with these guys. Back up some Lear Neuvers with these guys. And you have a potent force on the field. Uh, I think they'll really complement those cheaper, wider high elf strats very, very nicely. Rahagra's Pride, essentially the same thing. Uh, these guys do have the benefit of the Mighty Roar as well as, of course, rank 9 stats. I think they're going to be sim useful in a similar manner to the Warlines of Craze, with that of a benefit of being useful for leadership bombing and snaring fleeing enemy skirmishers. Especially against, say, Outriders, for example, who are only have 84 speed. You can net these guys down with the Mighty Roar, catch them, and massacre them very nicely, and uh, buckle a lot of those peripheral cavalry engagements. And with those souped-up melee stats, they're going to be a much bigger threat to, say, something like Reich's Guard or Knights of the Blazing Sun or units like that. Uh, so I do think the White Lions here are going to be quite a popular pick. And really, uh, I, I think it, this is kind of showing just a, a lot of the additions here for the High Elves are going to be, I think, good augments that really help them in some of their struggling matchups, uh, dealing with some of the problems they have, like heavy cavalry with the White Lions, as well as the Rangers covering chaff and the Silver and Guard giving you a, a better anchor. Uh, finally, the Arcane Phoenix, which unfortunately I don't think either of these guys is very good. I, I, I don't think I'd bring either of them uh, because... They're competing with very expensive dragons for the slot, and quite frankly, I don't think either unit is worth it in comparison. Uh, they're not cheap terror. They do have good stats on paper, for them. certainly when one considers that they've got a bound vortex, they've got uh, potential to heal, they've got physical resist, they've got uh, the attuned to magic for ward save. These guys on paper are not bad, but I think in practice you're just not going to bring them. First and foremost, Arcane Phoenix. Decent against single entities, it does apply fear and terror, it can bomb a formation, but I think in most cases you'd rather take a moon dragon. Um, moon dragon will be similarly survivable, breath attacks are a more reliable source of damage, and um, a moon dragon is going to have higher mass and striking power. Now yes, the speed is not going to be as high, you're not going to be as mobile, you don't have the potential for the fiery rebirth, but um, uh, the RNG on fiery rebirth can be brutal, it can screw you as well as it helps you. And I think bringing a dragon with heals is going to be more popular than the Arcane Phoenix. And otherwise, if you just need some cheap terror, you're going to bring a normal Phoenix or even a Sun Dragon or a, Fro a Frostar Phoenix. You're not going to bring this guy. Uh, and the Omen of Asterion, I think, is even worse because you get the unique Omen of Hope, which gives immunity psychology and a 55 meter aura. You do get rank 9 stats. But High Elves don't really need immunity psychology. Most of the units hold up fine. They've got great leadership. They've got Alarial for this, so and she's still going to be a popular pick. So if you bring Alarial, you don't even have to worry about this at all. Uh, and this unit costs almost as much as Star Dragon. This is a twenty three hundred and fifty gold unit versus Star Dragon's twenty four hundred. Uh, is it anywhere close to Star Dragon in combat prowess? No. Less armor, much less HP. Yes, you get physical resist, but uh, and the ward save, of course but much lower weapon strength, lower combat stats, and uh, the of obviously the Ember Storm is just not as reliable as the Breath Attack for dishing out hurt, and even less reliable when you actually have to deal with single entities or units like that, whereas Star Dragon can get a net, you can combo like a net and a Breath, delete a unit. That's not happening with the Omen of Asturian. So, unfortunately, I don't think the Arcane Phoenix is going to be very good for um, campaign, but I do think that, or for multiplayer, but I do think that in campaign, you might have a little bit of fun with these guys. Once again, though, they overlap a lot with dragons. I think dragons in campaign are going to be more popular as well. Uh, which I should mention, I guess. The uh, I do think that uh, the 
a lot of these other units will have more usage in campaign. I think Silver and Guard could be a decent mid-tier holding tool, though probably won't see them since Sloth and Seaguard are so good. Rangers, I think, are actually very strong in early game, especially which I was surprised by. I didn't expect this, but in a lot of the uh, campaigns, having a few of these guys can be great as an early game pseudo-cav uh, and to help you deal with chaff factions who might be swarming all over you, especially if you're not a fan of cheesing super hard. Uh, I do think these guys are a solid pick, even going into very hard and legendary difficulties, which is what I've been playing on when I've been doing campaign. Um, and so I do think that at least some of these units will have some good utility in campaign. But unfortunately, Arcane Phoenix, I do think, falls a little flat, which is a little tragic because it is honestly a gorgeous, gorgeous looking bird. But um, what can you do? But that is it for the incoming High Elf units. Uh, hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. Hopefully you found it a bit informative. informative. Be sure to let me know what you guys think. Uh, do you agree with my assessments here? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you see other potential options that uh, we could be seeing? Be sure to leave me with your thoughts down below and I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. I do thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all in the next one. Bye for now.